This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... What is the language that characterizes that report? He may, he might have, he could have. It is not parentary, it's not conclusive, it's not definitive. University of South Africa politics professor Lisa Batefo saying it's too early to, pre- to President Cyril Ramaphosa to resign. Details coming up also. Zambia says it will start rationing electricity December 15th. An international conference in Addis Ababa focused on concrete steps to leverage the power of the Internet and address risks and challenges. And Ghana and Cameroon are playing their last group matches now at the World Cup. We have these stories and more on African News Tonight. First, our top story, allies of South African President Cyril Ramaphosa say it would be premature for him to resign in response to a report by two judges and an advocate implicating him in possible crime. The president's office says an announcement about Ramaphosa's future is imminent. His alleged offenses, including tax evasion, money laundering, and covering up a crime, relate to the theft of at least 580,000 U.S. dollars from his luxury game farm in early 2020. Darren Taylor reports. Despite Ramaphosa's alleged criminality, it says a lot that some opposition parties don't want him to leave office, says University of South Africa politics professor Lesiba Tefo. It's not the right time for him to step down, but it will take some effort to persuade him to stay on. But I would love him to stay on, by the way. His shortcomings notwithstanding. Tefo points out that unlike most officials of the African National Congress, Ramaphosa doesn't need a top government post to make money. He's already one of the richest men in Africa. But several civil society groups are saying Cyril must go. One of them is the Right to Know campaign, represented by Varushka Memdut. The current office that he holds requires someone of a very high moral integrity. What we do believe is that President Ramaphosa will ensure that he is led by his moral compass and step down. Tefo, however, echoes many South Africans when he says the only people who really want Ramaphosa gone are those in the ANC who want to loot the state. At least under him, we have had a few people arrested. There is relative stability in the country. People know if you steal, he's not going to protect you, even as much as he might not stop you, but no longer acting with impunity. To that extent, I credit him. Unfortunately, this is an own goal that is too costly for him and for the country as a whole. Ramaphosa says the money stolen from him was legitimate proceeds from the sale of buffalo to a Sudanese businessman, Mustafa Ibrahim Hazim. According to the president, his farm manager then hid the cash inside a sofa. Not long after, robbers broke in and stole the money. Ramaphosa then allegedly sent his personal bodyguards to neighboring Namibia to capture the criminals illegally, assault them and retrieve the cash. He then allegedly bribed the robbers to keep silent about everything. Ramaphosa denies these claims, saying he reported the theft to the correct police channels, and they're investigating. But the panel's report shows it has serious doubts about his version. It can't find a police docket. It also can't find any trace of the alleged buyer of the buffalo, not even on social media or Google. And three years after the supposed sale, the animals are still roaming Ramaphosa's ranch. But, says Tefo, the president must stay, for now. What is the language that characterizes that report? He may, he might have, he could have. It is not parentary, it's not conclusive, it's not definitive. If anything, it says, given what we have at this juncture, Perhaps another process should be initiated that could conclusively decide on where he at and what should follow. 
In an ideal democracy, says Tefo, Ramaphosa would resign. But South Africa is not ideal. It's a nation emerging from almost a decade of corruption under former President Jacob Zuma, whose alleged crimes almost bankrupted the nation and left National Electricity Provider, ESCOM, the National Airline and other state-run industries crippled. ANC graft hasn't ended under Ramaphosa, says Tefo, but it's no longer rampant. The president has also given more resources to prosecutors and investigators to target criminals in the ruling party. Tefo says South Africa simply needs Ramaphosa. I need him to help us transit into a coalition government because we are headed in that direction and we need relatively stable hands. Forget about the detractors. They are far worse, by the way, than him. If they were to look me in the eye, I would tell them, are you better than him? Certainly not. Ramaphosa's spokesperson, Vincent Maguena, told VOA the president would soon decide what's in the best interests of South Africa. His departure or his continued stay at the union buildings in Pretoria. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. The World Health Organization today said it still does not have unfettered access to bring humanitarian aid into Ethiopia's war-torn northern Tigray region, despite a ceasefire deal signed between Addis Ababa and Tigray's leaders on November 2nd. WHO Emergencies Chief Michael Ryan said his team has not seen evidence of free access to those in need. Also today, the Associated Press says it has seen a report alleging that Eritrean troops have continued to kill civilians in Tigray. The AP says a report compiled by the Tigray Emergency Center shows that the Eritrean forces which fought alongside the Ethiopian military killed 111 civilians and injured 103 in the two weeks following the peace accord. The report, which documents violence in Tigray's eastern zone, also says there have also been 39 kidnappings and disappearances. Also, humanitarian workers and residents told Reuters news that Eritrean troops have been seizing food, vehicles, gold and doors and windows from homes in a dozen in dozens of towns since the truce was signed there are concerns the abuses could threaten the deal between Ethiopia and Tigray Eritrea was not part of the peace process 3,000 delegates and participants from across the world met this week to set out concrete steps for leveraging the power of the Internet while addressing risks and challenges. The 17th International Internet Governance Conference, convened by the UN Secretary General, opened Monday in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, and concluded today. UN officials say the meeting comes at a crucial time when the benefits that the Internet offers access to telemedicine, digital banking, and e-learning are elusive to approximately 2.7 billion people. The misuse of the Internet has also led to a spike in misinformation, disinformation, and cybercrimes. From addressing Internet shutdowns to bridging the digital divide and safeguarding human rights, the forum, under the theme Resilient Internet for a shared, sustainable and common future brought together all segments of society from governments and businesses to civil society and youth to share best practices and experiences that will help shape national and global policies on the Internet. The outcomes of the meeting will provide important inputs to the global digital compact that will be agreed on at the UN Summit of the Future in 2024. You're listening to African News Tonight, live on the, uh, on the Voice of America. I'm Yehayis Wuhib in Washington. In October... Zimbabwe became the first African country to approve the use of the injectable HIV prevention drug called Cabotagravi, Cabotagravir. As Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare, Zimbabwe, many are eager for the drug to become available. A 32-year-old Zimbabwean woman who requested not to be identified says she received an injection of the HIV prevention drug called Cabotagravir while she was working in the United States. Yeah, I'm excited that there's now Cabo in Zimbabwe. I'm excited. It's good news. 
Well, I prefer the injection to the pill because the injection is convenient. You only get a shot um, after every two months. Unlike the pills, you have to take them every day at the same time. And there's a risk of defaulting because there are a lot of things that happens during the day or in life, actually. You might go to a funeral, you forget your pills at home. So with this injection, you only get a shot after every two months. And it's only six shots per year, which is better preferred to tablets. Zimbabwe is the first African country to approve the use of the Kappa de Gravia or Cub Lab. The United States approved the drug in December 2021 and Australia in August 2022. In 1999, Zimbabwe introduced a 3% AIDS levy to help fund the country's response to HIV and AIDS. Individuals paid 3% income tax and employers and trust paid 3% on profits for the effort. The World Health Organization has commended Zimbabwe for approving Kappa de Gravium, saying it would pave the way to providing more safe and effective options for HIV prevention. Farai Masekela, the head of evaluation and registration for the Medicines Control Authority of Zimbabwe, or MCAZ, says for now, Kaba Tigrevia is only allowed for HIV prevention. There are going to be other, other um, preparations containing Kaba Tigrevia, which uh, may be submitted at a later time uh, by the applicants or the manufacturers of the product, which will be used for treatment. But the current one, which has approved, is meant only for prevention of HIV and not for treatment. Dr. Nyarazo Mugodi of the University of Zimbabwe Clinical Trials and Search Center, who headed trials in nine African countries, says the drug is very effective and is calling for Zimbabwe to roll out Gabba de Gravia as soon as possible. Because this is a good drug which we as women need access to. So I cannot give you a timeline, but all I can say is uh, to the policymakers who are listening out there uh, to expeditiously make it available to women because us as African women, we continue getting HIV at alarming rates and uh, one infection is one infection too many. When we have got something that works, we should make it available to them person or the persons who need it. Supporters say access to drug will also help Zimbabweans stop relying as much on other countries for drugs to treat HIV AIDS. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Arare, Zimbabwe. A court in South Africa last week ruled that UN experts can intervene in a class action lawsuit against mining giant Anglo American over lead poisoning in Zambia. South African and British lawyers filed the lawsuit on behalf of about 140,000 Zambian children and women whose health was allegedly damaged by a colonial era lead mine. Angola American has denied wrongdoing at the Kabawi mine, which it was involved in from the 1920s to the 1970s. Kathy Short reports from Kabwe, Zambia. It's a busy morning in Chowa Township in Kawe, which on the surface looks like an, an ordinary Zambian town. But rights experts and lawyers say Kawe is one of the areas in the world most polluted by lead poisoning. Rachel Kutayaya says her three boys, aged 12, 14 and 16, were sickened by lead, but she's unemployed and can't afford treatment. Kutayaya struggles to feed her kids with the 20 US dollars she makes per week selling tomatoes. <laughs> She says her children's IQs have been affected. In school, Kutayaya says they do not focus well, so their performance is poor. She says one of them often has stomach problems and blames lead poisoning. Britain-based rights law firm Lede estimates 140,000 Zambian children and women of childbearing age were sickened by the colonial-era lead mine in Kawe. They've been seeking a class-action lawsuit since 20. 
2020 for lead poisoning at the mine against mining giant Anglo-American in a court in South Africa. The lawsuit was filed in South Africa because Anglo-American has offices there and Zambian law does not allow class action lawsuits. The lawsuit alleges the victim's lead poisoning was due to the mining corporation's pollution at the mine from the 1920s to 1970s and is seeking reparations. Anglo-American declined to do an interview with VOA, but in an emailed statement repeated denial of responsibility for any lead poisoning. Spokesperson Sibosiso Shabalala said Anglo-American was just a shareholder until 1974 in the mine, which was operated by Zambia Broken Hill Development Company, who were responsible for employee health. The Zambian government and various entities ran the mine from 1974 until it was closed in 1994. Shabalala called the lawsuit opportunistic and implied a commercial motive in singling out Anglo-American. Kawe community representative Barry Mlimba says they simply want justice. Uh, what we are looking for is the families that are affected to be compensated. And probably the company that was um, that started mining here in Kawe to provide uh, remedial measures so that the areas where this lead uh, pollution is coming from uh, can be treated. The South African court ruled on November 25 that UN experts could submit their findings at a court hearing in January that would decide if the class action lawsuit can go ahead. Lawyers for Lady declined an interview request but welcomed the judgment in a joint statement emailed to VOA. It said corporate legal accountability and access to justice for the Kawe lead poisoning victims has been outstanding for generations and is of paramount importance. Anglo-American had already agreed to interventions by Amnesty International and the Southern Africa Litigation Center. Human Rights Watch submitted the application to allow UN experts to intervene in the case. The rights group says soil in the township surrounding the Kawe mine has concentrations of lead more than 150 times higher than the recommended international standard. In, since 2019, the Zambian government supports a 60 million US dollar World Bank funded project to provide medical help to the affected communities. Gideon Dalama is the national coordinator for the Zambia Mining Environmental Remediation and Improvement Project. He says more than 10,000 women and children have been treated so far. And we procured lead test kits to support the intervention as well as uh, diagnostic machines that are being used for this activity, which machines have been placed in four health centers within Kawe. A March report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment Report listed Kawe as one of the world's 50 most polluted places on Earth. It said 95% of children in Kawe suffered elevated blood lead levels caused by lead mining and smelting, which can impair brain development and cause blindness, paralysis and death. Kathy Short for VOA News, Kawe, Zambia. And now for World Cup highlights. We have standing by the host of VOA's sunny side of sports, Sunny Young. Welcome to African News Tonight, Sunny. Sporty World Cup greetings, Jaheus. Where to start in this nail-biting, well, exciting, unpredictable <laughs> World Cup soccer t- tournament? Well, Yeheus, right now, Ghanaian fans, uh, I think they're probably feeling a little low. We're in the uh, 60th minute in Qatar, and the Black Stars of Ghana trail Uruguay by a score of 0-2. to two. I think one of the key points in this game, Yeheus, a game changer in the first half, in the 20th minute, Ghana's team captain, Andre Dede Ayu, one of the sons of Ghanaian football great, Abedi Pele, stepped up to take a penalty kick. I thought it was a tentative penalty kick by Dede. It, it just didn't really have that, that conviction behind it. The Uruguayan goalkeeper saved it. And, I, and after that point, Yeheus, Ghana seemed to drop off in its spirit, whereas Uruguay came right back within a few minutes and scored two goals, uh, both by uh, Derek Ketta 
uh, one off a header, and the other, the other uh, from close range. So right now it's Uruguay 2, Ghana 0. We're in the 61st minute, and Ghana really up against it as it tries to stay in this World Cup. But, Yehaz, I want to give shout-outs for a couple of pride, a pride of lions from Africa. Yes, a pride of lions, the Atlas Lions of Morocco and the Lions of Taranga from Senegal. They are both through to the round of 16 in Qatar. Morocco playing some excellent football in this tournament, Yehaz. They beat Canada on Thursday by a score of 2-1. They topped their group with seven points, and now they look ahead to a match on December 6th against Spain, almost, almost a regional rival uh, for, for Morocco. I, I, checked my, uh, I checked my Atlas, Yehaeus. Uh, if we go from Morocco to Spain across the Strait of Gibraltar, it's only about 14 kilometers. So there are definitely some ties between Morocco and Spain. Spain, of course, lifted the World Cup in 2010 in South Africa. And then on Sunday, we have the Lions of Taranga from Senegal going up against yet another pride of Lions, Yehaeus. The three Lions from England. That should be a great match. Uh, the English manager, Gareth Southgate, says he describes Senegal as a very dangerous team. They are, of course, the reigning African champions, playing without Sadio Mane, their injured captain. But that said, uh, Khalidou Koulibaly has taken over the captain's armband, and he says the team has a lot of faith. He, he believes that uh, in the faith that Africans across the continent have given the team, and I think they're going to give the English a heck of a match on Sunday, Yehaeus. But right now we're in the 63rd minute. In Qatar, Uruguay still leads the Black Stars of Ghana by a score of 2-0. Uh, the Black Stars are going to have to make a big comeback to stay in this World Cup. And uh, that's that's the way it is right now, Yehaz. That's the way it is. Uh, Sonny, <laughs> I, I'm just perplexed here. Uh, history kind of repeating itself 10 years ago. Uh, a penalty kick was missed, and now a penalty kick is missed, and that penalty kick miss kind of started the downward spiral for Ghana. I mean, it's just You know, that's a, that's a great point, Yehaz. And uh, Suarez still on the pitch for Uruguay, uh, and, and, and he has been a thorn in Ghana's side uh, at two World Cups now. And, and the penalty kick analysis, Yehaz, is spot on. Ghana's fortunes changed when Dede Ayu uh, failed to convert that penalty kick. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's tough times for the Black Stars. There is still time, though, you have. Maybe they can show some of that Ghanaian fight and get back in this match. Yes, the Ghanaian fight. <laughs> and one thing, uh, Sonny, before I let you go, uh, Japan and Spain. Japan uh, surprised me yesterday. The Japanese, uh, they, they have a quality team, Yehaz. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think they could do something. I mean, this has been a tournament of surprises. It really has. And the Japanese fit right into that. And, uh, yeah, watch out for them in the knockout stages. And one more thing. Uh, how about uh, tomorrow? The, you know, U.S., uh, Netherlands? Well, Yehaz, I have to believe the Americans are the underdogs in that match against the Dutch. Uh, that said, the Americans will have uh, their their uh, star midfielder, Christian Pulisic. Uh, he, he suffered a uh, pelvic injury uh, against Iran, but he says he will play against the Dutch. Uh, and okay. so they're, they're yeah, well, I, I don't count out the USA either. Go yet. USA. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Sonny, for your input. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Baro, and our engineer, Bob Bass, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.